In this lecture, we're going to talk about multiple comparisons. Multiple comparisons are a group of analyses that we could use following our univariate or one-way analysis of variance. They are designed to be follow-up tests to expand our understanding of the data and the implication of that data. Now in this lecture we will look at a combination of pre and post test designs. Each have their own strengths as well as limitations in what they bring to the table in terms of added information or added value for you. The decision as to which analysis to use will be up to you, the researcher, given the type of situation you're looking at, the data you have available, and the necessity of the results. In other words, what it is you hope to do with those results. So to review, when we looked at the analysis of variance design, the simple one-way approach, we were looking at comparing mean scores among a number of treatment conditions two or more treatment conditions to be exact. Through the analysis we were able to produce an output which was called an F statistic or an F value. That F value was then interpreted to determine whether or not a significant difference exists among the population means. Now what that F statistic tells us is that there is or is not a significant difference somewhere in our data. The key here is that it only tells us that there is a difference, the existence. It does not tell us location. From the ANOVA design we have no indication of where the difference actually exists. For example, if we were comparing three groups, groups A, B, and C, a significant F value would lead us to believe that one or more of the groups are different from the others. But which groups are different? Is group A different from group B? Is group B different from group C? Or perhaps it's a combination. A and C are both different than B. There are several possibilities, and so the necessity for a follow-up is usually quite great. The designs we're going to look at in this lecture will facilitate our understanding of identifying the location of differences. So before we proceed, let's again look at the one-way ANOVA. There are a couple of problems or issues we have with the one-way ANOVA. First of all, it doesn't tell us all that we need to know. When we conduct research, we typically do so for a purpose. In other words, there is something that we're trying to prove or better understand. But when we conduct research and run statistical analyses, we do so on hypotheses. These hypotheses, specifically the null hypothesis, are generated estimates. They're not actual based in fact or true life experience. Now the null hypothesis that we use for all of our statistical analyses is that there is no difference between the groups. It's based on a premise similar to the legal system in our country in which you are innocent until proven guilty. We assume your innocence until we are able to gather enough evidence to prove otherwise. Here, the null hypothesis states that all the groups are the same. There's no difference between these treatment conditions. 
and that belief is held until we gather enough evidence that the contrary is actually the truth. There is a difference between these groups. Well, as I mentioned, this is not always what our research sets out to do. A lot of the times we're not necessarily looking at is there a difference between groups. In fact, we may actually be more concerned with the impact of the difference or the size of the difference. A second problem with the one-way ANOVA is in how it controls for type 1 error. Type 1 error, as you'll recall, is a condition when we have false positives. We're saying that there are differences when there are not really differences. Although ANOVA design controls for type 1 error by doing multiple tests, multiple pairwise comparisons in one analysis, there still exists the possibility of type 1 error being observed in the ANOVA design itself. So while it is better than the alternative, it is not perfect. In fact, it is far from it, and error still is a very real concern for researchers. So why do we do the one-way ANOVA? Well, we've just talked about some of its limitations, and they are apparent, but it still is better than doing pairwise comparisons or using t-tests. The way to improve on the design is by using some of these additional comparisons. Step back, we did not do that Bonferroni correction of taking the alpha divided by n. That's what keeps it ultimately at the 0.05 everyone. Here you see that once we get up to near 20 comparisons, we have a collective error rate now of 64%. That means for our analysis, 64% of the time we're just guessing. If that were the case, there really would be no need for you to do the research. You could flip a coin and do better. So hopefully that gives you a little background as to why we look at doing some of these designs. The intent is to gather additional information, explanatory information that tells us a little bit more about what's going on in our data without sacrificing error rates or increasing the likelihood of making a type 1 error. So there are two basic comparison types or categories that we'll be looking at, a priori and post hoc. A priori comparisons are those that take place before data is collected. These are planned. We have some idea of how we would like to interpret or compare our data. This prior understanding could be based on previous research, anecdotal evidence, or personal experiences we have. On the flip side, we have post hoc comparisons. Post hoc comparisons happen after the fact. These type of comparisons are unplanned. They are the result of us obtaining a significant F value. Now that we have a significant F value, we want to dive deeper and find where the differences actually exist. 
And so there are a number of a priori and post hoc analyses and comparisons you can do. The choice of which one you use will depend on how many comparisons you have to make. So as we begin looking at these, let's start with the post hoc tests first. Again, these post hoc comparisons are after the fact. We've decided that an ANOVA design is best to answer our research questions. We run the ANOVA, comparing the means of multiple groups. The ANOVA result produces an F value or F statistic. We look at the significance value and determine that there is a significant difference between these groups, somewhere between these groups. We now want to know where it is, and so we look at employing one of a variety of post hoc comparisons. Now there are multiple post hoc comparisons that you could use. In SPSS alone, you have over 15 different post hoc comparisons that you can use. They all work to achieve the same goal, just go about doing so in a different manner. To facilitate our learning and focus our understanding, we're going to look at three different types of post hoc comparisons. The Fisher least significant difference, the Tukey honestly significant difference, and the Chaffe test. Let's look at the Fisher's least significant difference test. This is also referred to as the protected t-test, and we'll come back to that in a moment, what protected means. The Fisher LSD test was developed in 1935 and was the first pairwise comparison test. This was the first attempt to start looking at post hoc analyses to follow up on an ANOVA design. To effectively use Fisher's test, you must have a significant F. In other words, your ANOVA design has to first alert you to the fact that there is a significant difference between the groups. If not, running this analysis is not appropriate. A second caveat here is that we typically use this when we're comparing three or four treatment groups. Now the ANOVA design is used when we have two or more treatment conditions. But for this test, three or four is what we're looking at in terms of number of treatment groups being compared. So computing a Fisher's least significant difference is essentially a series of individual t-tests. Our goal is to compute the smallest significant difference between two means, hence the least significant difference. What is the smallest amount of variance we could have between two means and still say there is a significant difference? Once we identify that value, any mean differences between pairwise comparisons that's greater than that value, by extension, would have to also be significant. If we establish here's the boundary, here's the benchmark for significance, anything above it 
also would be significant. Unlike some of the other post hoc tests, there's no correction made for multiple comparisons. In other words, statistically, there is not a way to adjust the analysis or our understanding of the data for the fact that we have multiple pairwise comparisons. This is not necessarily a bad thing as it equals more power overall for the test. And as we learned in a previous lecture, power is a good thing. The more power a test has, the more valuable the results are from it. How is it able to do this? It does so by using a pooled standard deviation from all the groups not just those being compared. So in the denominator of the formula used for Fisher's LSD as the computer runs the analysis, it's looking at a pooled standard deviation for all groups, not just those being compared. If we compare groups A, B, and C, but right now we're only looking at the pairwise comparison of A and B, this pooled standard deviation is going to incorporate group C, even though it's not factoring into the pairwise comparison at the moment. Now statistically you can compute a Fisher LSD post hoc test by hand. There are formula that you could use. It's also one of the options that SPSS has for you. In selecting post hoc tests, the Fisher LSD is one of the options you can choose. A third method you may consider is using something called PRISM. PRISM is a free software download that you can get that installs a applet program on your computer that computes these values for you. All you need to do is enter in some preliminary figures and statistics and these analyses are computed for you. In the learning module associated with this lecture you should find the link to the website where PRISM can be downloaded. Now earlier I mentioned the fact that the Fisher LSD test is a protected t-test. That means that it is used only when there is a significant F value in the initial ANOVA design. PRISM results, when you use the PRISM software, report unprotected test results, meaning that it does not take into account whether or not the initial ANOVA design was significant or not. Some view this as a more conservative approach but others believe it may lead to more false positives. So when using PRISM results, realize that the values you have need to be interpreted cautiously. Now a second post hoc test we have is the Tukey HSD or Honestly Significant Difference Test. Unlike the Fisher test, this one does control for the fact that we're carrying out multiple simultaneous comparisons. We're looking at all of the possible pairwise comparisons between the groups that were included in the initial ANOVA design. 
our p-value or our significance threshold is downgraded. It's downgraded to account for the fact that we have multiple tests. This is very similar to the Bonferroni correction that we addressed at the beginning of this lecture. Here you see the Tukey HSD formulas. Now we're not going to be conducting these by hand, but I did want you to get a sense of what it is that the test is doing. The honestly significant difference is going to be a value that's created. A value that's going to serve as the benchmark when determining whether or not two groups are different or not. We do that by taking the mean square error. That's the denominator of our ANOVA formula. Recall that ANOVA is looking at the mean square treatment divided by mean square error. So we take that mean square error and divide it by the square root of n, how many people we have overall in this study. That value is multiplied by Q, which stands for the studentized range statistic. This is a value that could be found in a table. The table is found in many statistics textbooks and also online. Once you have all these values, performing the computation gives you a final value, a D value. That is the HSD value the honestly significant difference value. We take that value and compare it to the mean differences between the various pairwise groups. If the difference between the groups is greater than this D value, we say that the groups are significantly different. So let's say we have three groups, A, B, and C. Group A has a mean of 10. Group B has a mean of 4. And group C has a mean of 3. And we compute the Tukey honestly significant difference. And we get a D value of 5. What that means is you take that 5, that value of 5, and that is now the threshold for significance. And we compare it to the mean difference for each pairwise comparison. So if we were to compare groups A to B, group A had a mean of 10, group B had a mean of 4. 10 minus 4 is 6. The mean difference here is 6. How does that compare to our D value of 5? Well, 6 is greater than 5, so we say that there is a significant difference between these groups, A and B. Now what about our second one? Again, our HSD value is 5. Now we're comparing groups B and C. Group B had a mean of 4. Group C had a mean of 3. 4 minus 3 is 1, so our mean difference is 1. How does 1 compare to 5? Well, it's less than 5. So we say that there is not a significant difference between 
groups B and C. And so you keep continuing this process for each of the possible pairwise comparisons. Now the Tukey test is a rather conservative test. It's weaker than a pre-planned analysis. If you were just to do a t-test at the beginning of your design, But that's okay. Sometimes being conservative is a good thing. We're able to account for more and be on the safe side. Now the third post hoc test we're going to look at is the Chaffe test. The Chaffe test uses the same F ratio approach that was used in the ANOVA design to test for significant differences between any two treatment conditions. The same formula or approach that you have for computing the mean squares between or, or the mean squares treatment in an ANOVA design is used but now you're only doing the treatments that are in the comparison. If looking at groups A, B, and C, you're comparing group B to C, then you would not include data from group A in this mean square value. The mean square within or mean square error that you have from the original ANOVA design is now used as the denominator for this new approach. We compute that Chaffe value and determine whether it is significant or not. If it is significant, we're then able to say that there is a difference a significant difference between those two groups. Now again, SPSS will compute this for you. It's simply an option that you click under the post hoc tabs at the end of an ANOVA design. But to assist your understanding, here's a look at the formula of actually what the Chaffe test is doing. Again, we have the mean square error in N. We have a probability value of making a type 1 error. Our F value. Now with these post hoc tests, there are some interesting understandings. You may get a situation where a post hoc test indicates that none of the pairs are significantly different from one another. How can this be if the F value led to an overall rejection of the null hypothesis, meaning that a significant difference exists how could it exist that we can't find where that difference is? It could be related to the fact that pairwise tests are not as powerful as the overall F ratio itself. In other words, sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of all its parts. When looked at collectively, and the interplay between these variables and these groups, we may find a overall significant difference that doesn't exist in the pairwise comparisons. So now that we've talked about some post hoc tests, let's turn our attention to the a priori tests. And again, the a priori tests are the planned comparisons 
that we establish or set up at the beginning of our research. These planned comparisons are more specific. In other words, we know exactly what types of comparisons we want to make. As a result, they're more powerful because they are grounded in theory or rationale rather than being purely exploratory in nature. Because they're designed at the beginning of the research process, it forces us as researchers to pay more attention to what it is we actually hope to accomplish in our research. The idea behind these a priori comparisons is to establish contrasts or specified comparisons between particular sets of means that test a specific hypothesis. So let's say we just set up uh, an amusing little example here. Would you tell a lie to your work supervisor? All right, we're trying to assess would employees lie to their boss. Now let's say we have two different groups. Those who are paid to tell a lie and those who are not. We could run an analysis and maybe we find a significant difference. Where one group is more likely to tell a lie than the other. Or maybe we find that there's no difference. But what if we add a third group? Take it a step further. So now we have three conditions. A group that is not paid to lie a group that is given five dollars to tell a lie, and a group that is given five thousand dollars to tell a lie. Would you expect the results to change? Perhaps people who are opposed to lying and you offer them five dollars would likely not do it. But five thousand dollars changes the scenario. $5,000 is much more of an incentive than $5. So now we have three conditions, no money, $5, $5,000. If we were to establish a priori comparisons, we could talk about is it money that is the variable is it the amount of money that's important? So we could have some theoretical ideas of what we think. More money could be more convincing to people to do things that ordinarily they would not do. There are multiple a priori comparisons we could look at. We could look at doing multiple t-tests linear contrasts, which we'll spend the majority of our time talking about, orthogonal contrasts, the Bonferroni t-test, also known as the Dunn's test, confidence intervals, and effect size measures. Let's begin with the multiple t-tests. What a multiple t-test does is very similar to the post hoc tests. It looks at pairwise comparisons given the data we collect as part of our ANOVA design. It differs in that all pairwise comparisons are considered in a post hoc test. Again, because we're trying to follow up on the F test that says there is a difference, now we need to find it. But when using multiple t-tests, 
you choose which pairwise comparisons you want to use. In other words, you don't have to explore all of them. You are determining which ones are important. A problem with the multiple t-test is that the error rate accumulates. We showed er earlier what happens when unattended error rate accumulates. For each of these pairwise comparisons, let's say we have a 0.05 level. Now that we're looking at them individually, those 0.05s are accumulating. If we do three tests, that's 15% right there. 0.05 plus 0.05 plus 0.05. So the multiple t-test approach should really be used when you only have few comparisons to make. In our example a minute ago, we have two comparisons, money or no money, and then we look at how much money, a little money or a lot of money. Now traditionally, this multiple t-test a priori design is similar to some of the post hoc tests in that we needed a significant f value to make the multiple comparisons. If overall there's no difference, then there's really not a need to go find where the difference is. If one doesn't exist, we don't need to find it. However, new approaches or new understandings of research are in favor of doing the multiple comparisons, even when there's not a significant F value present. Earlier I mentioned that the whole is different than the sum of all the parts, well sometimes we need to work backwards as well. Maybe collectively we find no significant difference, but when we parse it out into the individual comparisons, we find differences there. Two approaches to the same idea, but ultimately the same goal of trying to further understand our data. The next one we look at is the linear contrast. And as I mentioned, this is the one that I want to focus on is this will be the one you use the most. In a linear contrast, we're doing essentially what you would do in a t-test. We're comparing two groups. What we're doing though is we're creating a scenario where a group could actually represent a collection of groups. So in our example, we have three groups. Group A receives no money for lying. Group B receives $5 for telling the lie. And group C receives $5,000 for telling the lie. We could compare groups to form a supergroup. So if we want to have a pairwise test, we could look at group A, no money, versus the combination of B and C, the $5 and the $5,000 group, which collectively we could refer to as money. So our pairwise comparison then becomes people who receive no money, versus people who receive money. The benefit of doing these contrasts is that now we could test for research hypotheses in addition to statistical hypotheses. Statistically, our hypothesis would have been, is there a difference between these groups? No money. $5, $5,000. A research hypothesis could look at what is the effect of increasing money 
on convincing people to lie. If you offer more money, are they more likely to lie? And that in turn could lead to another other studies or questions to answer. How much money would you have to offer? What is the tipping point for people where they're willing to go against their morals or values and actually tell the lie? Now in doing contrast, there are some requirements. For each group that we compare, we're creating coefficients. These coefficients are going to factor into the statistical analyses. In essence, they're going to tell SPSS which groups are you combining and then which groups are you comparing. So every group is going to get a coefficient. When we add up all of the coefficients assigned to the different groups in our analysis, they should equal zero. All of the individual groups added up the coefficients should equal zero. The sum of the contrast groups should also equal zero. So group A versus BC combined should equal zero. And finally, the number of comparisons you do should be equal to the degrees of freedom for treatments, meaning your comparison should be limited to one fewer than the number of treatments you have. If you have three groups, then you should only do two different comparisons. If you have four groups, you should only do three comparisons. So you're probably wondering, what are these contrast coefficients? How do I come up with these? Well, they're not random numbers. There's actually a random, a standardized approach to assigning coefficients. So as I said, you always try to have the number of contrast or comparisons equal to that degrees of freedom, k minus 1. So however many treatments you have, one fewer than that is the number of contrasts you should do. Contrasts are set up so that you're comparing only two groups of information. Think of an old-fashioned scale that has the two plates, one on each side. We're trying to see if there's a difference between the two. On one side, we would have group A, the no money for lying group. And on the other side, we would have groups B and C, the $5 and $5,000 groups. Now, there are are many ways to separate the groups. It really depends on the research questions you have. But typically, we look at control and treatment groups and various conditions of those. Here, our control group is no money. Our treatment group is money. But there are different types of money. We had a $5 group and a $5,000 group. Now I mentioned that all of these contrast coefficients have to equal up to zero. The way to accomplish that is by using positive and negative values. One side of the equation will have positive values. The second side will have negative values. That way they'll cancel each other out and leave you with a net balance of zero, which is what we're looking for. I also mentioned that every group gets a coefficient. Even those that are not playing a role in the comparison we're making. 
if a group is not part of the direct comparison, you give it a contrast coefficient of zero. Zero is a way to statistically isolate or ignore that group without actually getting rid of that group. They exist, they were there, but this is a way to mathematically not have to address their existence. So for example, what if we had A, B, C, D, E, and F, but we weren't looking at F in this analysis? We would have negative 3, negative 3 for A and B, positive 2, positive 2, positive 2 for C, D, and E, and F would get 0. Now how that works is because this coefficient value is then multiplied by the mean for that group. Multiply zero by any number gives you zero. So giving f a coefficient of zero eliminates that group statistically from the analysis. And so that is how you go about choosing your coefficients. So again, here's some examples. We have four groups, A, B, C, and D. In this first example, we're looking at A and B. There is one condition on each side. So that means they both get a coefficient of 1. One is positive, one is negative, so that when you add them together, they equal zero. Now in this comparison, we mentioned nothing about C and D, so those groups both get zero. Again, you can look at the difference between C and D. Again, one, negative 1 on the other side 0 and 0 because A and B are not factored in and so you can see for a number of different types of designs that you could do how the variables and these coefficients come into play another type of contrast although not the most common approach is an orthogonal contrast Orthogonal contrasts are when the conditions or contrasts we have are independent of one another, meaning they are not dependent or reliant on the other conditions for their values. So for example, in our illustration of people lying for money. If you would lie for five dollars, it stands to reason that you would definitely do it for five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars. Your score on those other conditions is dependent on how you do there. If you're going to do it for five dollars, you would do it for any value above that. In SPSS, there is a way for you to look at orthogonality and address that in your analysis. The majority of the time in our research, we will have contrasts or conditions that are dependent on one another. And that's okay because in the research design we have, we're hoping to find trends or themes or patterns in other words, we are expecting there to be some relationship. So the linear contrast is the one that I would really encourage you to spend more time focusing on. The Bonferroni T is used to control family-wise error rate. Just as we did for the pairwise comparisons in the post hoc, 
when we have multiple pairwise comparisons, we need to control our error rate. We could do that ahead of time and establish the new criteria by which we'll be determining significance. For example, if we had a 0.05, but in our design we had five different comparisons, we would take 0.05 divided by 5, which gives us 0 0.01. 0 0.01 now becomes our level of significance. Any F value with a significance value greater than 0.01 is not significant. Even if it's, say, 0.02, which is less than the traditional 0.05, but we're not using 0.05 anymore. We've corrected for the error rate and now readjusted our significance to 0 0.01. Another a priori design is to create confidence intervals. A confidence interval allows for greater specificity and accuracy. If I were to ask you how long does it take you to get to campus driving from home or work or wherever you come from? And let's say you tell me 20 minutes. How accurate is that 20 minute estimate? Is it 20 minutes exactly? Is it 20 minutes exactly every single time you come to campus? Rain or shine without fail? Probably not. The actual time it takes you to get to campus likely varies on every trip. When we know that there is variability in play in our values and the data that we're collecting, it's better to use a confidence interval. A confidence interval gives a range that the actual value is between this range of scores. For example, you could give me a confidence interval and say, tell me that it takes you between 18 and 22 minutes to get to campus. That way, if you catch that extra red light or traffic is pretty light and you get here in less time or more time than it typically takes you, it's in this confidence interval. And so we could set different types of confidence intervals. How confident do we want to be? We could have a 95% confidence, a 99% confidence, a 60% confidence. The more confident we are, the less useful the interval actually is. That sounds counterintuitive, but let's think about it for a moment. If I wanted to be extremely confident, 99.999% confident. I could tell you that it takes me between one minute and two hours to get to campus. That way I've addressed all the different conditions that may come up on my commute here. Traffic, road closures, my car breaks down, I run out of gas, anything. But does that really tell you anything about what the trip is? Maybe you're looking at buying the house next to mine. And you want to know, how long does it take to get to work? What's the commute like? And I tell you, between a minute and two hours. Well, you didn't really walk away with any better understanding of what the commute is like. If I lower the confidence, the interval gets smaller. A 60% confidence may look something like the average time is 19 minutes and 45 seconds and 20 minutes and 15 seconds. A much smaller interval, but we have less confidence in it. So kind of a slide rule here. 
you need to determine based on the data that you have and the research that you're conducting, is it more important to be accurate and precise? I'll give you a 30 second window. It's gonna take you between 19 minutes, 45 seconds and 20 minutes and 15 seconds. Or is it more important for you to be confident an hour to two or a minute to two hours, somewhere in that range? The final type of a priori design we'll look at is the effect size. And so we talked about effect size in previous lecture. Effect size is the magnitude of observed differences between the means. It's a measure of practical significance. We could get statistical significance, but it really may not mean a whole hill of beans. Practical significance speaks to whether or not we need to act on these results, change policy, change programming, whatever, based on what we're researching. You could determine an a priori effect size, meaning I want my study to achieve this level of effect size. What that means is using a program such as G-Power, you would be able to go in, establish your a priori effect size, what you would like to get, and it will tell you how large of a sample you need to achieve that type of statistical effect and practical effect. So now, as you go to conduct your research, you know that you need to get this many people in your study. So these are the different types of a priori designs. Now, as I mentioned, the linear contrast is the most common one and the one that I wanted you to focus on the most. So in our remaining time, I'd like to look at how you could conduct a linear contrast using SPSS. So let's look at a study narrative. And this is a study that uh, Professor Andy Field over in England uses in his teaching of statistics. So the pharmaceutical company Pfizer claims that their sexual stimulant drug Viagra makes men better lovers. You could take a moment and either agree or disagree with this claim. But let's say we decide to be researchers and empirically test this claim. So we're going to establish three groups. In group one, they're going to receive a placebo. They're going to be given a, a sugar pill or let's say an M&M, something that has no therapeutic value to it. Group 2 receives a low dose of Viagra. And group 3 receives a high dose of Viagra. Our dependent variable is going to be an objective measure of libido. We're going to ask the partner of these individuals who take either the placebo or the low or high dose of Viagra to rate that person's libido. And so now what we're going to do is look at comparing the means of the three groups. The average libido score for the placebo group, the low dose, and the high dose group. So prior to running the analysis, we need to have SPSS look at some planned comparisons or contrasts. And then we could also look at setting up post hoc analyses should there be significant differences. To do this, we're going to take the same approach we had to doing an ANOVA design. As always, we're going to go to the Analyze command on your toolbar is that's where all the statistical analyses are under. Under the Analyze tab, 
you're going to select the compare means tab. When you select the compare means tab, you'll have a number of different options. From here, you want to choose one way ANOVA. Choosing one way ANOVA brings up a new window. This new window is the main dialog box for ANOVA. Here we want to establish the design. So we need to take the variables on the left hand side and put them in the appropriate column on the right hand side. So our dependent list, that was our dependent variable. In this case, it was the measure of the person's libido by their partner. So we put that variable in the dependent list. The factor is the independent variable. What is the differentiating factor between the groups? Well, here it's the dose of Viagra, whether they got nothing, a little, or a lot. So we put that in our factor box. Now to run the one-way ANOVA, you would just click on the OK tab and run the design. But now we're looking at doing a little bit more. Specifically, we want to do the planned comparisons and the post hoc tests. So if you look at the bottom of this dialog box, you see tabs for contrasts, post hoc, and options. We're going to do the contrasts first. This contrast tab is where we go to set up our planned comparisons. Click on contrasts and a new window comes up. This is where we do our one-way ANOVA contrasts. We want to first make sure that polynomial is checked. It should be the default for your SPSS program. If not, make sure it's checked. When it is checked, under degree, the drop-down menu, options are available for you. When polynomial is not checked, you do not have access to that drop-down menu. In that drop-down menu, we want to make sure that linear is the approach that we have for degree. So click on linear if that is not the default for you. Next, we need to go ahead and add in our coefficients. So in the middle on the left-hand side, you see where it says coefficients. Here's where you can type in the value. After each value, you'll then click that Add tab, and that adds that coefficient. We're going to make sure we do all of them. Let's say for this design, we want to compare placebo, those who receive no Viagra, to people who receive some type of Viagra, whether it's a low dose or a high dose. So we're combining the low and high dose. Using the parameters that I mentioned earlier on how you assign coefficients, for the no group, the no Viagra group, on the other side there are two groups, low and high dose. So the coefficient for that no group becomes a 2. For the low and high group on the other side is none, the placebo group. There's one condition, so their coefficient each becomes a 1. Now again, it's up to you whether you want negative 2, positive 1, positive 1, or if you want positive 2, negative 1, negative 1. For this example, I'm going to use negative 2 for the placebo and positive 1 for the two treatment groups. So in that coefficient box, I would type negative 2 and click Add. I would then do 1, Add, 1, Add. Now even though the 1 is the same, you have to do it twice. And so you should see your three coefficients now in the box at the bottom.
Once you have all your coefficients in place, you can click on Continue, which will bring you back to the main ANOVA dialog box. Now that you've established your contrast, click OK, and that will run the design. Once your design runs, your SPSS output window pops up. So let's look at the output that you get. One of the first things you'll see is your ANOVA design. This is the Between Groups ANOVA design. In yellow, you see the combined. This is all the groups together, a traditional ANOVA design, not looking at any comparisons. It's simply looking at differences between placebo, low group, and high group when all put together. Notice that our F value, 5.119, has a significance of 0 0.025. That significance is less than 0.05, so it tells us that there is a significant difference between these groups somewhere. The linear term, what I have here in blue, is the contrast. Here you see the F value is 9.966 significance of 0 0.008. Again, that significance is less than 0.05, so there is a significant difference. Now here, this linear term is looking at a trend analysis. It tells you that there is a significant trend. What was the trend that we had? Well, we had a no group, a small group, and a higher group. So the trend is that libido scores increase as the amount of Viagra you have increases. Now we want to look at our comparison that we had. So if you continue scrolling down your output data, you'll now see the comparison results. First, you'll see a box that shows you what are the contrasts we had. So you can make sure that these are the coefficients we used. We had the placebo with a negative 2, and both the low dose and high dose of Viagra as 1s. We then could come down, and here you see the t-test, the pairwise comparison. Notice that the T value 2.474 has a significance of 0 0.029. There is a significant difference between placebo and Viagra. That's what our comparison looked at. It wasn't concerned with how much Viagra, just is there a difference between taking nothing and taking some type or some amount of Viagra. But again, we want to know how much or where's the difference. Here's where our post hoc tests come into play. We can go back to our ANOVA main dialog box by again going to Analyze, Compare Means, One Way ANOVA. And you'll see that what you had already had entered in is still there. So now let's click on the post hoc tab. The post hoc tab is going to pull up options you have. And as I mentioned, there are several different post hoc tests. Let's click on the LSD, the Chaffe, and the Tukey, as those are the three we've talked about in this lecture. Now, ordinarily, you would only pick one post hoc test because they all will give you the same results. Wherever the difference lies, they'll all tell you the same you will not have a situation where one says it's between groups A and B and another says it's between groups B and C. 
But I select all three here just to kind of show you what the output looks like for each of them. Just keep in mind when you do the analysis, you only need to pick one of them. Clicking continue brings us back to the main screen where we click OK and our analysis is run. So let's look at our results. The results of the multiple comparisons, the post hoc test, show you all of the pairwise comparisons. So for the Tukey HSD, at first you see, going down the list, it compares placebo to low dose, placebo to high dose. And then you have low dose to placebo, low dose to high dose, high dose to placebo, high dose to low dose. Using 0.05 is our benchmark for significance. The only one that is significant is high dose to placebo. That's where the difference lies. Now you should note that if you do the Chaffee test or the Fisher LSD test, the result is always the same. The difference is always between high dose and placebo. That's why it's not important for you to do multiple. Just pick one that you like and do it. So what that mean? A couple of things should stand out for me. One, high dose is significantly different from placebo only. Two, low dose is not significantly different from placebo. Based on these findings, our result or our interpretation of the results would be that it's only a high dose of Viagra that produces a noticeable increase in measured libido. What that means is if you are taking Viagra in hopes that it's going to make you a better lover, you need to take a higher dose. Taking a small amount will really have a trivial at best, but more likely no effect on you. And so this concludes our lecture on looking at a priori and post hoc planned comparisons. Again, these are great follow-ups to the ANOVA design to get more specificity about what your results are actually telling you.